This week on the show, we have got some terrific news for a change from the United States Postal Service. We got problems over at Etsy, eBay, and Mercari, and a whole bunch more reselling news. What is up, Galaxians? Welcome to episode number 265 of the Galaxy CDs Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk podcast. My name is Ryan, and I'm going to be your host. We have got a mess of reselling news to get to this week. In addition to a what sold recap, I will leave timestamps to the various sections in the show notes and the video description below. So if you want to go to a particular platform's news, you can go straight there. But with that out of the way, let's get right in to this reselling news. News updates. So, great news for a change from the United States Postal Service. Uh, they have announced no January price hike for stamps and other market-dominant products. We talk about, I've been talking about, for I don't know how many years now, three years, four years, the twice annual United States Postal Service price increases that come along, and they have announced that the next one that is due in January is actually not going to take place. This article appeared over on Value Added Resource, and I will, of course, as always, link to these in the show notes and the video description down below. The United States Postal Service has announced today, this is from the 20th, that the price of stamps and other market dominant products will not see their usual increase in January as Postmaster Louis DeJoy looks to blunt criticism of his Delivering for America plan. A recommendation by Postmaster General Louis DeJoy not to raise prices in January of 2025 for market dominant products, which includes first class mail, was accepted by the governors of the United States Postal Service. Accordingly, the price of a stamp to mail a one ounce single piece first class letter will not increase. The Postal Service's operational strategies, they say, are designed to boost service reliability, cost efficiency, and overall productivity. That's been his mantra since he got there. He went on to say, quote, our strategies are working and projected inflation is declining, said Postmaster DeJoy. Therefore, we will wait until at least July. So there's hope there, at least, that maybe even the July one will be canceled. I'm not holding my breath, but uh, at least until July before proposing any increases for market dominant services. That is, uh, to say the least, good news for online sellers, particularly of media products, as media mail is the big one in this category, in addition to stamps. But as far as sellers go, media mail is the big one. It is part of this market dominant product category and should not be seeing an increase in January. That will be particularly helpful because the one that went into place back in July was humongous. It was a very significant increase that hit media mail users, whether they be customers who are paying for shipping or sellers who were paying for shipping if they offer free shipping, particularly hard. It was a massive increase. Unfortunately, the news doesn't end there. That still leaves the door open for an increase on competitive products, which includes things like Priority Mail, Priority Mail Express, and of course, Ground Advantage. And while USPS has said the holiday peak rate is only temporary from October 6th to January 19th, and we did cover that here a couple of weeks ago, you can probably expect a January increase will follow soon after. And this article says likely lock those higher rates in going forward. Now, I've not found that to be the case. The, the last couple of times, now last year there was no seasonal increase. Two years ago and the year before that, the permanent increases that went into effect in January were both a bit lower than the seasonal peak surcharges were. So there's some hope there that maybe these things won't be quite that bad. Uh, we'll see. They usually announce these in the fall, so I would expect sometime in the next couple of weeks we'll know what's going to be coming down the road in January for these services. I Let's say I, I would remain skeptical that they will not increase the prices on those, particularly given that in many cases, ground advantage has become cheaper than media mail. A lot of sellers that I talk to in media have commented that you can ship a lot of packages now that formerly would have been cheaper by media mail, by ground advantage. We'll see what that looks like, but at least for the moment, no increase in media mail rates and such in January. So that is awesome, awesome news. 
More shipping news, however, and this one's quite, not quite so good. So Etsy sellers were confused by the USPS priority flat rate variations due to the zip code based zip code based rate hike. That's a mouthful. Easy for me to say. Sellers are confused by apparent discrepancies in the United States Postal Service priority mail rates to some areas as Etsy failed to advise them of recent zip code based changes to negotiated shipping rates available through the platform. One seller raised their concerns in the Etsy community forum today, believing they were being overcharged for some flat rate labels. As I'm trying to purchase my USPS flat rate shipping labels this morning, I'm noticing the prices are as much as 81 cents more on some labels and not others happening on more than one label. My shipping profiles are set for flat rate. Etsy, please take a peek as I want to ship today, but certainly do not. Am not willing to pay this overage. That's why I chose flat rate. So there are no surprises in shipping. USPS flat rate for a medium box ships anywhere for the exact same price, fifteen nineteen, and it's now trying to charge sixteen on several orders. What's mostly like most likely occurring here, of course, is that Etsy has implemented the same zip code based rate changes that other marketplaces like eBay and Pirate Ship and Stamps.com announced back on September sixteenth, but Etsy does not appear to have warned sellers or provided any advance notice. The change affects negotiated discount rates these service providers receive, but unlike the previous zone-based rates shippers are typically used to, this one targeted the 17,000-plus zip codes across the U.S., mostly in rural or less populated areas. Okay, so I'm going to go on a rant here, and I'm going to, I'm going to put myself <laughs> uh, on the main screen to emphasize a couple of things here. So number one, shame on Etsy for not talking about this, for not publishing this information. eBay, as soon as this was announced by the post office, eBay had a notice on their site. We covered it on this show, what was it, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Uh, it was published on Value Added Resource. It was probably on e-commerce bytes as well. Uh, but Etsy failed to disclose it to their sellers. And that to me is a problem. Now, that having been said, <laughs> as sellers, we bear some responsibility to know what is going on. It's one of the reasons I do this show. It's one of the reasons that Liz does value added resource and the Steiners have e-commerce bites to provide sellers with information that they may miss otherwise. But sellers have a responsibility. If you're running a small business, it is not the responsibility of these platforms to hold our hand through every single change that may take place, particularly those that take place outside of their area of responsibility. In this case, this was a change implemented by the United States Postal Service. This was not something that Etsy did. We're going to cover one here in a few minutes that eBay has implemented that they did not tell anybody about, and that is their responsibility. That is a change that they're making to their site that affects sellers that they did not announce. And that to me is a real problem. This one, again, I feel like Etsy should disclose it. Uh, they, it, when I had David Lee on from Mercari on Wednesday, one of the things that he talked about that he really stressed was the importance of building trust between the parties, the sellers, the buyers, and the platforms, and the necessity of transparency. And Etsy, for my money, has failed on both of those counts by not disclosing this. But again, that having been said, we as sellers bear some responsibility to pay attention to what's going on. And this was publicly available information and not to call this particular individual out, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, a quick Google search would have shown what was probably going on here. And this seller chose to go on the message boards and essentially bash Etsy as though this was an Etsy problem. One of the reasons I feel like the platforms are reticent to come out in public and talk to us uh, outside of their gated walls and their events is because we are so quick as a group to blame the platforms for things that a lot of times they just don't have any control over. And we're going to get into some things here later on that they do. And I'll, I'll call them like I see them. Uh, when there's a problem on a platform, I'm going to call it out. Uh, but this is not one of those cases. And when that is the relationship that we want to put forth with these platforms, it's absolutely understandable why a lot of times they don't have our back, why the relationship is adversarial rather than a partnership with trust 
and respect going both ways. So again, not to be too whatever, but shame on that seller, A, for not knowing what was going on, and B, for not taking the time to find out before blaming someone who had nothing to do with it, and shame on Etsy for not announcing it anyway. So I'll get off my soapbox now, but that that has been bothering me <laughs> uh, since I read this article. Uh, this information is available. If, you, if you're a seller, I have, I can't tell you how many sellers I've had that have reached out to me over the years and said, thank you for this weekly recap of all of these updates because I don't read the notices on the platform. So to that point, Etsy could have put that out there and sellers probably would have just ignored it and not read it anyway. But I've had sellers numerous times tell me point blank, they don't read those notices and they appreciate shows like this or sites like e-commerce bytes and value added resource who put this information out there so that you can be aware. So if you are not bookmarking one of those sites or following or subscribing to podcasts or YouTube channels like this one, please consider doing that because we provide a lot of useful information that you may miss. Otherwise, I even said on value added resources, Facebook posts about this, uh, had the buyers on Etsy been following her uh, platform or following my show, they would have known about this and it would not have been a surprise. So plenty of blame to go around here to say the least. Uh, but uh, again, sellers bear some responsibility, in my opinion, for what goes on in their businesses. You can let me know in the comments down below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on Spotify, if you think I'm out of line with that. But uh, this one, this one bothered me a little bit. <laughs> Uh, moving on to uh, hopefully some better news from Etsy. So they made some 2024 updates, uh, some of which they had announced previously, some of which are new. So I do want to cover some of these. Uh, they are changing buyer experience surveys, site credit refunds, a Colorado delivery fee, and more. So let's get into this. Etsy announced five things to know for September 24. 2024 with cyber savings etsy design award finalists buyer feedback on support experiences from both sellers and etsy search visibility which we talked about a couple of weeks ago refunds for etsy credit and the introduction of the colorado delivery fee some of these like i said had been announced previously and i've already covered on this show so i'm not going to recover those but i am going to hit the ones that appear to be new uh, they did announce a Cyber Savings Spectacular. Etsy reminds sellers that there's still time to join the Cyber Savings Spectacular, which is set for November 18th through December 3rd. Sellers must opt in by Tuesday, October 1st. So you got, what is that, about a week to go for that. And you, But you have to offer at least a 25% off discount and offer global shipping during the event to be considered for this marketing feature. There is a link in this article to sign in and opt in over at Etsy, but you've got to have global shipping turned on and you got to offer at least 25% off, which would uh, rule a lot of sellers out. I'm not willing to go 25% off uh, over on Etsy. I just don't, I don't go that deep. So uh, collecting buyer feedback to better the support experience. Etsy is testing a new way to collect feedback from buyers about their support experiences, both from Etsy and directly from sellers with new surveys after a buyer requests help with an order. So this is a different one. Well, Etsy says the results of these surveys will not be displayed publicly on listings or impact visibility. Sellers can expect feedback received will likely at the very least filter down into new policies or requirements in the future as Etsy continues to try to find ways to keep buyers coming back to the site. I was reading uh, some posts the other day where a buyer had an experience with a seller on Etsy and the seller did not, never responded. Uh, that's the kind of feedback that Etsy is looking for here. If you're not supporting your potential buyers by communicating with them, that is probably going to show up in one of these surveys and probably not lead to good outcomes. <laughs> uh, Etsy said, we want to do everything we can to keep buyers coming back to Etsy and shopping from you. The overall support experience with both Etsy support and between sellers and buyers can make a huge difference in whether a buyer comes back to shop again. That's why we're testing a new way to collect feedback from buyers after they request help with an order. After a support experience, we'll ask buyers for feedback through a short survey. We'll ask whether their issue was resolved, how the seller's service experience went, and how easy it was to get help on Etsy. All of this information, they say, is kept internal and confidential and won't have any exter external impact on your shop. At least for now, I will probably add editorially, uh, we won't share this feedback on your shop listings or reviews, and it will not impact your visibility on Etsy. We're using the information we collect to better understand buyers' full support and service experience. 
and hope to use the feedback to determine what investments or product changes we could make to best support you and how we can share this information back to you so you can continue to better the shopping experience. So be aware of that. If you have a customer that reaches out with a service issue of some sort, they are going to get a survey from Etsy afterwards asking how well you did in taking care of them uh, and how well Etsy did, to be fair, in taking care of them. Uh, there were a few other things here that were things that had already been covered. This was an interesting one, Colorado retail delivery fee for buyers. Etsy is required by the state of Colorado to buy to charge buyers a small fee of 29 cents for orders of physical goods shipped to addresses within the state of Colorado. This fee is not charged for sales of digital goods. As a seller, you may notice debit entries on your payment account page for the Colorado retail delivery fee for applicable orders shipping to the state of Colorado. No action is required on your part. Etsy collects from buyers at checkout and remits this fee on your behalf. Uh, this article points out that this one was surprising as the Colorado retail delivery fee was passed into law and became effective in July of, wait for it, 2022. <laughs> uh, with all marketplaces that are required to collect and remit sales tax, under marketplace facilitator law is also responsible for collecting and remitting this fee. So for two plus years, this has been a thing and Etsy has not been collecting or remitting it. So I don't know if they're if they're going to have to pay and make that up. I don't there's no indication in this article how that's going to be handled, but uh, if you see a random 29 cent fee labeled Colorado retail delivery fee, that's what that's all about over on Etsy. Uh, the article continues hopefully Etsy is smart enough to have read the law and will implement this correctly. Uh, and have it stated separately from regular sales tax, unlike eBay, which does not do that. They roll that right into the tax or else they could be in for some additional trouble, the article says. It's also concerning, they point out, that it does not mention the Minnesota retail delivery fee that went into effect on July 1st of this year. So there's another fee uh, that you may see. If you're on eBay, you probably won't see it. They probably have just rolled it into the sales tax line again, but uh, Etsy may be adding that one as well it's amazing the unique and creative ways that the government comes up with to take a little bit more money from everyone uh so that wraps up kind of what's going on with some new announcements over at etsy here's some not so good news from etsy owned reverb they're quietly undertaking layoffs impacting marketing design support and more we've talked here a few times about how etsy uh, did their kind of house of brands strategy where they have bought some other sites they had bought and have since divested, uh, I believe it was Brazil based LO7. Uh, they have purchased Depop and they're also the owners of the music equipment site Reverb. Uh, Liz over at Value Added Resource does have a link here if you'd like to talk to her if you were impacted by those layoffs. And again, there'll be links to all this in the show notes below. Sources familiar with the matter confirmed this round of layoffs eliminated a little, little over 40 roles over at Reverb. The previous cuts last year, that puts the total headcount close to where it was when Etsy first acquired the company back in 2019. Most of these employees appeared to be longtime Reverb staff from before the acquisition or, or those who joined shortly after Etsy took over, raising concerns about the loss of critical institutional knowledge and experience and increasing the possibility this may be a last-ditch Hail Mary effort before exploring a sell-off. As I mentioned, they've already sold off that L07 at a significant loss uh, just to get it out from under their hair. Uh, the Etsy-owned musical instrument marketplace is undertaking these layoffs uh, to try to make that house of brand strategy pay off. There has been no official corporate announcement as of the writing of this article, but posts on LinkedIn show multiple references to, quote, many talented co-workers impacted across various departments, which included product design, marketing, customer service, and trust and safety. The cuts appear to have been handed out swiftly, the article says, with some saying they were not even given a chance to say goodbye, instead posting their parting thoughts to coworkers online. So that's not, again, these layoffs are never good, but not giving people the opportunity to at least say goodbye to their coworkers seems unnecessarily harsh to me. <laughs> uh, as someone who has done layoffs in the past when i was in corporate america uh has closed stores and let entire staffs go uh there's a humane way to do that and this does not strike me as having been that so uh again reverb was acquired by etsy in 2019 as part of that house of brand strategy which also included the acquisition as i mentioned of depop and lo7 
It has had questionable results as these smaller sites have yet to add significant growth to the bottom line. The sale of LO7 led to speculation about whether Etsy may spin off Reverb and or Depop sometime in the near future as well, especially once it became known that notorious activist investor Elliott Management had taken a sizable stake in the company and now has a seat on the board. Elliott is well known for pressing companies it takes an active interest in to cut costs, increase revenue, and sell off parts of the business, like in 2019 when they brought their influence to bear on eBay, resulting in the sale of StubHub and their classifieds business, which you may remember, as well as making other changes. While a spinoff doesn't appear to be on the table just yet, Reverb is under increasing pressure to perform with cost-cutting measures and a new team focused on growing revenue announced earlier this year. So tough times over at Reverb um, and more broadly continuing at Etsy. Moving on to eBay. Uh, here is what I was talking about earlier, a, a change to a policy that does not appear to have been announced that has uh, many sellers up in arms. I was just recently working with another seller on some things on her site, and we had discussed the fact that outbound offers were good for a couple of days, and that has now been extended to four days. Uh, this article also over on Value Added Resource, eBay extends offer expiration to four days in, oops, unannounced change. Let me go back here. Got carried away, hit the wrong button. Apparently I hit it way too many times. And I am totally lost. Here we go. <laughs> uh, technical problems. I'll edit that out later. No, I won't. I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> uh, sellers are frustrated with yet another unannounced change as eBay extends expiration time on offers from two days to four days with no notice. eBay community members express their dismay with the change, saying it interferes with business operations because the listing is locked and can't be edited as long as there are open offers still hanging around waiting to be accepted or to expire. This becomes an issue, particularly if you are trying to make changes, uh, which is what I was consulting with a, another seller on, to business policies. Because a lot of times you cannot, a, a change to a business policy is considered an edit on eBay. And if you have items that you're trying to make a change to the business policy, for instance, you want to change the shipping time or speed, um, and there's a, a pending offer on it, it will not allow that to change. Worse, it creates a whole new business policy to capture those items that were not eligible for the change. And a lot of people end up with pages and pages of random business policies with two or three or four items in them uh, because of things like this. So it is, on the surface of it, it's bad enough that they've made a change without announcing it, but it creates all kinds of downstream problems as well. Why is eBay automatically setting the time limit to 96 hours when I make an offer to a buyer? One user said, I noticed this change in the last couple of days. They say it's not all items. Does anyone know what's going on? One person said, I hadn't noticed that yet. I just sent offers moments ago. And when I check, it does say three days and 23 hours left. So 96 hours from the time the offer was sent. It's frustrating since we can't make any other changes until it expires or they respond. I will look and see if there's a new setting for it anywhere. There does not seem to be either globally or per offer. I just sent feedback through the offer to, I suggest anyone else annoyed by this do that too. So be aware, uh, offers have extended now to four days. If you have an issue with that, you can put in your feedback to that. Uh, others shared that four days may be disruptive to discounting practices, which could likely result in less offers being sent as well. Some said since there was no notice, unaware sellers could also get stuck with late shipment dings or have problems if they need to set their account to time away. So a real problem, and again, like I talked about in the earlier segment, transparency and trust, transparency and trust. All these sites talk about how important those things are to them and how important their relationships are with their seller community in particular. And then you have a situation like this, and again, not to throw a site under the bus, but this is not the way you should conduct business. If you're going to make a change to your policies, which they're absolutely within their rights to do, you have to let the participants know what is going on. Uh, that is, you've essentially doubled the amount of time if people, again, wanted to make other changes and are accustomed to a two-day time frame for these offers, and now they're at four days, that can be really problematic. And you just, 
it's a problem. eBay should have announced this. Uh, shame on them for not. They have also rolled out over at eBay a new AI-powered image-based listing experience for trading cards. This is something they've been talking about for a while, and they have finally officially announced the launch of AI-powered bulk listings for trading cards. They've introduced this new feature, building on their COMC partnership to streamline the selling process. The tool appears to be in a phased rollout, so it may not be available to all sellers just yet, but those who do have it have found the option for multiple listings from photos under create listings in the seller hub. There are several steps to it. Convert photos to drafts, eBay says, skip the hassle of creating listings from scratch, upload your photos, and we'll handle the rest by using your photos to prepare drafts for you to review. We talked about, was it Depop? doing something similar last week for kind of all listings right now, at least on eBay, this is just for trading cards. It says organization pays off when uploading. Select your images in the order you want them to show up in each of your listings. The minimum size for photos is 500 by 500 pixels. And if you're watching on YouTube, there's some screenshots here of what this all looks like. Once the photos have been uploaded, eBay's image recognition technology works to identify the cards and fill in important item details automatically. Uh, we shall see if that works like it says. Uh, in a lot of cases, as I talked about last week, I'm not sold on AI. It does not always do that. YouTuber Paul Carl Cards took the new tool for a spin, expressing overall positive opinions of the feature with some minor points off for occasional lag in loading and still having to manually fill in some data or double check to make sure eBay's AI got it right. Remember, uh, eBay does not take responsibility for any errors. Uh, they made that explicitly clear with the AI uh, description tool, item description tool, that you as a seller are still responsible for the accuracy of the information. So. While this may help speed the process, it is not going to completely automate it because you are going to have to check every single listing to make sure that the information that eBay has filled in is in fact correct. Uh, the user said the only drawback with this is that you have to do a lot of data entry still yourself and then check all of the cards. So if you are a trading card seller over on eBay, let me know if you've tried this tool, if you have access to it yet and what your experience has been with it. Uh, apparently, there's also some changes going on to eBay's uh, feedback detailed seller ratings. Sellers who noticed a change in how eBay labels uh, detailed seller ratings and feedback are leery that it could signal eBay will make them more important in their seller performance matrix, metrics, rather, matrix. I feel like I'm in the matrix. Uh, on the eBay website under detailed seller ratings, eBay offers the following explanations of them. For a more detailed view of a seller performance, you can view their detailed seller rating. This is a breakdown of how buyers have rated that seller in the following areas. Item description, how accurately was it described? Communication, did the seller communicate well with their buyer? Shipping time, how quickly did the seller ship the item? Shipping and handling charges, were the costs reasonable? On Saturday, a frequent commenter on the eBay discussion board said they noticed a change in how they had been labeled. My Cottage Books and Antiques opened a thread back on September 14th to write in part, if you look closely at your detailed seller rating, you'll notice that item description is now, quote, accurate description, unquote. Shipping time is now shipping speed. Shipping and handling charges are now reasonable shipping cost, while communication remains communication. So they've changed the verbiage of these theoretically to make it more representative of the question they're actually asking. Um, items description is a little vague. Accurate description helps narrow that down a little bit. Shipping time, again, maybe a little vague. Shipping speed, maybe a little more specific. You can let me know in the comments what you think of these changes. Um, I'm kind of ambivalent if I'm being honest about them. Um, DSRs used to count in seller matrix, but they don't any longer. And this user wrote, I would hate to go back to that. Buyers should not be judging shipping costs, for instance, and holding against the seller with prices going up four times a year from USPS. A buyer has no idea how much is reasonable. Shipping cost is the only thing I do not have a perfect 5.0 rating on in my DSR. It's like 4.8 uh, because, again, as I've talked about on this show before, Amazon has essentially convinced buyers that shipping is free, that there's no cost involved. I think at some level people understand that that's not really true, but I don't think they fully grasp until they go to the post office and try to ship something how expensive 
it actually is to ship things. And a lot of sellers get dinged for shipping cost when it is actually not their responsibility and people just don't know. They just have no concept of how much it costs to ship some of this stuff because they don't they don't do it they're not exposed to it um it's not malicious it's just the legitimate ignorance of the information so let me know what you think of that or if you have noticed that over on ebay uh, one more thing here from eBay. This is an announcement. Uh, they have appointed CarMax CEO Bill Nash to their board of directors. eBay has announced the appointment of CarMax CEO Bill Nash to the board of directors, hoping his, quote, deep understanding of retail and e-commerce, unquote, and extensive knowledge of building customer loyalty and trust can help turn business strategy to growth. Uh, again, eBay struggling for growth. We've talked about it every time they have a quarterly earnings report. Their growth is one percent if that in a lot of cases so they're trying to trying to get some more people on board at those upper levels to help he is the president and chief executive officer of carmax the largest retailer of used cars in the u.s which includes its carmax auto finance subsidiary he oversees all aspects of the business including strategy finance operations technology marketing and human resources it's a wonder he has time to join the board of another company <laughs> Uh, under his leadership, CarMax has undergone the largest transformation in its history by investing significantly in technology and digital initiatives to become an omni-channel retailer. So eBay continues to talk repeatedly about their desire to be a technological leader, to bring magical innovation and all of that type of stuff. And they continue to struggle a little bit with it. And this appears to be an attempt to find a guy who can potentially help them with that. He was promoted to the president and CEO role back in 2016 after having served as an executive VP of HR and administrative services. He was also elected to serve as a member of the board. He's been with CarMax since 1997. So uh, probably doesn't have an impact on your day-to-day -day operations as a reseller on eBay just yet, but it may in the future. So I thought it was worthy of talking about. Now let's get into some some technical issues. Uh, I mentioned in the intro, uh, eBay and Mercari both had some significant problems this week. We're going to start with eBay. Seller Hub was down on 918. Drafts went missing. There were errors in listing forms. Um, I know I experienced uh, issues with uh, in the midst of trying to do a listing on mobile. It would just say downstream error and would lose everything. A couple hours later, it seemed like everything that I was in the process of working on was then in my drafts, but it was a really, really inconvenient situation. Again, to be fair, these platforms are massive undertakings and making changes sometimes leads to unintended downstream consequences. We have become very spoiled with 99.9% .9 uptime on a lot of these sites. And when they have problems, it is super disruptive. And you, I know you can make the argument, these sites have one job, <laughs> and that is to facilitate uh, sellers getting things sold to potential buyers. And when the thing doesn't work, it really drives you nuts. But to be fair, uh, technical issues are just going to happen. Uh, but last week was not a particularly great week in that front. eBay sellers were reporting Seller Hub was down with technical issues causing those listing errors and missing drafts. Uh, there was also a problem uh, which did not seem to get rectified until Sunday morning with the advertising widget on the seller dashboard, which was showing different information every time it refreshed. In many cases for mine, it was actually showing zero, like I had not had a single click from an ad. However, if I went to the actual ad dashboard, everything looked normal. So it was just a problem with data not being transferred to seller hub which again leads me to believe it was a problem with Seller Hub in particular. Uh, eBay initially seemed unaware of it and then finally did uh, say that they were seeing an issue. I'm trying to see if I had anything else highlighted here. No, but if you experience problems on eBay, you can let me know in the comments how disruptive they were. I essentially, whatever day it was, I don't know, maybe Wednesday, I just stopped listing early and went and did something else with my time. Uh, it, it got to a level of frustration that I just couldn't do it anymore. And the next morning, everything seemed back to normal, uh, but it was a, it was not a pretty scene over at eBay, nor was it over at Mercari. This was something that I did bring up with David Lee when he was on the show on Wednesday. Um, and he was really quick to defend 
the the work that Mercari did to try to resolve this and other technical problems. And I don't have any fault with any of the staff there that are, are trying to fix these things. My question, which he kind of dodged, was did the layoffs, have they impacted Mercari's ability to stay on top of technical issues? And for my money, they probably have. Mercari, for me, has had more issues over the last six months than I feel like they had had previously this week was particularly bad. They suffered a major outage on Monday. They also had problems with automated ratings, which delayed payments. Mercari US was completely down for several hours this morning with many users questioning whether it was really a scheduled outage for maintenance as the error message claimed or the sign of a bigger technical problem across the site, including automated rating issue that delayed payments for some orders. This to me, Again, I'm going to go back to what David said about trust and transparency. When I tried to sign on to Mercari at about 10 after 7, I got the message that said, oops, something went wrong. Please try again later. And over the next hour or so, every time I did that, I got that same message. And then sometime between 8 and 8.30, that message changed on the screen to they were performing scheduled maintenance one of two things that was either a disingenuous if not completely dishonest placeholder to try to cover up the problem or if it was in fact scheduled maintenance that they just forgot to change the screen for it's an absolutely boneheaded move if you'll pardon my <laughs> uh, anger at it to schedule maintenance at seven o'clock in the morning on a monday when east coast shippers are going to be getting up to try to ship their orders from the weekend uh, most sites schedule any kind of technical service or site outage for like two o'clock in the morning on Saturday, Sunday morning, Saturday night into Sunday morning, when the least amount of users generally are going to be on the site. So again, to go back to trust and transparency, that was not, in my opinion, handled particularly well in this case by Mercari, when there were plenty of users on the site, the Reddit boards are full of the same comment. People were on the site and saw that, oops, something went wrong. And then it was replaced by this message that said that this was scheduled maintenance, which for my money is clearly not what was going on there. So uh, anyway, users trying to access the site or app during the outage were shown a generic down for maintenance message indicating that it was due to scheduled updates. However, as usual, as I just said, users flooded Reddit looking for more information and many were skeptical of the message. It wasn't scheduled. They're probably scrambling to try to fix it and don't know how, so they're claiming this was scheduled. We need to call this company out on their BS, said one writer, especially if we're going to allow them to handle our money. Uh, and they have had, to be fair, previous issues with deposits and money not being processed correctly. So this is not... Again, I, I like Mercari, and I appreciate uh, David's willingness to come out into the wild and talk to us, uh, but they have had a myriad of technical issues that does not always inspire uh, warm and fuzzy feelings among their seller base. The message that was shown on the status page also told a different story with no mention of this being routine scheduled maintenance. And again, if they had been, why may they have needed to investigate the cause? The article says... Other users speculated the outage may have been related to other technical issues which were reported over the weekend, most importantly a problem with the automatic rating functionality that has been causing delays in payments being released to sellers for items shipped last week. So we've talked about Mercari's rating system, and if you're not a seller on Mercari, essentially what happens is you ship the item out, and once it is marked as received, the tracking says the buyer has got it, the buyer has three days, to leave you a rating, at which point you're, you then give them a rating and your funds are released. If they do not do that within three days, Mercari's system is supposed to automatically give you a five-star rating and release those funds to you. That system apparently was not working properly last week. Uh, one writer said, has anyone else been experiencing this where it says Mercari couldn't complete the transaction after three days? It says contact the buyer, which if they haven't rated in three days, they aren't rating. Plus, I'm not messaging buyers asking for ratings. Fair enough. We shouldn't have to. This is Mercari's system. They developed this. I have talked about this program in the past. Uh, I'm not a fan. I feel like once I've shipped the item and there's tracking, you ought to release my money. I've, I've done my part. 
Uh, but that's that's their system. But th if it's going to be their system, they need to make sure it works. So now every order that the buyer doesn't rate, I have to reach out to Macari to get the payment released. It's BS. It's ridiculous enough that we have to wait three days, and now that's not even working. Uh, again, the Macari status page did acknowledge the incident, saying it was resolved on September 15th at 6.52 p.m. Pacific time with orders missing auto ratings, receiving them over the next 24 hours. So if you were impacted by that over on Macari, you can let me know. Um, interesting side note for those of you. Uh, again, thank you to everyone that did come out. And thank you again to David Lee from Mercari for coming out to the live show. Interestingly, uh, more of you show up on a random Wednesday to watch me do listings in the Batcave <laughs> uh, than came out to watch David uh, talk with us. And that particular video is literally one of my poorest performing videos in the last eight months. Um, let me know in the comments why, why you think that is. I'm curious why people were not interested in seeing what he had to say uh, or what that conversation looked like because I thought that was probably a pretty good get and I know there's been some mixed feelings about how how open he was in some of his communication both in my interview and with some of the previous ones that he had done um, but uh, for that to have been such a poor performing episode for me was really pretty surprising. But again, thank you uh, again to David and to everyone who came out and who has watched that video. Um, and I do still hope that we're able to do it again and that we we find a way to bridge the gap that a lot of folks seem to feel uh, exists there in terms of the communication. Last bit of news, this is over on Amazon. Uh, they have asked sellers to offer discounts for October's prime big deal days. They announced this a while ago. It's kind of the second bite at the prime days Apple. Uh, this one occurs in the fall. Amazon is encouraging sellers to offer discounts for its upcoming prime big days, big deal days rather in October, telling them their participation would help them build awareness and boost sales. The sale is offered exclusively to prime members and is another enticement for shoppers to join prime, which of course, Benefits Amazon. Last year, Amazon held the Prime Big Day deals on October 10th and 11th. Last month, it officially announced it would hold the sale again this October, but did not specify dates at that time. It has now come out that it's going to be the 8th and the 9th of October. Separately, Amazon told FBA sellers they had until September 13th to get inventory to the fulfillment centers in order to participate. That ship has sailed. That date is passed. So if you haven't done that already, you've missed it. Uh, Amazon noted the following information about these uh, uh, discounts. Amazon retains the right to reschedule or cancel the promotion at any time. They've already spent a ton of time and money marketing it, so I would be very surprised if the date changed. If your promotion is not approved within seven days, it will be canceled by Amazon. They do not guarantee that orders will be placed for the promotion, and Amazon doesn't guarantee the deal will be published on the chosen day or time. They've left themselves a lot of wiggle room there. <laughs> Uh, they want you to offer a discount, but they're not saying they're necessarily going to pass it along. Uh, fascinating. Amazon published a uh, FAQ about the sale, which it described as a holiday kickoff event that offers Prime members exclusive access to early holiday deals across pop popular categories, including deep discounts on products from top brands. So if that's something that you're likely to want to participate in, uh, it's too late to send your merchandise in, but you still have some time to tell them that you want to do it. So, gosh. 40 plus minutes in and that is finally a wrap on the reselling news uh man a lot going on please share in the comments what you what you think of that if you got anything out of that or my various rants let me know in the comments please do me a favor if you're watching on youtube hit that thumbs up button if you're not currently a subscriber to the channel or a follower of the podcast please consider doing that as well and feel free to share this with anyone who you think might enjoy hearing me rant with that Let's do some what sold. It was not a particularly spectacular week. If you follow me over on Instagram at Galaxy CDs Rocks, uh, I talked about, I think I did 74, 73 or 74 listings sold, which is a little off the boil for me. Uh, but there were a few interesting things and I thought we would go over them uh, today like we usually do this. Pardon me for taking a drink. All this yammering on and ranting has me parched. <laughs> uh, 
this first item sold over on eBay. I uh, almost always pick these up. Plutarch's Lives, one volume edition, hardcover in its dust jacket, with uh, published by Modern Library. It was the giant edition, the, uh, the Dryden translation. This Plutarch's Lives almost always is a good seller. The Modern Library version of it in particular does really well. This is one I picked up at the library sale I went to a few weeks ago for the low, low price of just 50 cents. It was in really nice shape, as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube from the photo, uh, Katie Reeds pointed out those Mylar covers wreak havoc on taking photos because it's super reflective. You can see me holding the phone. <laughs> Ah, so ghetto, Ryan. Uh, anyway, Plutarch's Lives, uh, one volume edition, sold on a best offer for $20 plus shipping. The order total was $27.86. I paid $4.15 in regular fees, $1.95 for promoted listings general fee, $6.13 to ship. As I said, it cost me $0.50 cents at the library sale, so my total costs were $14.46, leaving me with a net profit of $13.40. Another one on eBay. This is one that I picked up at an estate sale where I bought a bunch of um, woodworking, carpentry, electrical uh, manuals from the 1930s through the 1950s. A really cool sale. Bunch of old stuff that, of course, people had overlooked for multiple days. This was the Principles of Electricity, a semester course for pre-induction training from 1943. This was a paperback that was published for the military back during World War II. I had it listed for $24.99, sent an offer out for a, to a watcher, and it sold for $21.24 plus shipping. Order total $28.98. I paid $4.30 in regular fees, $203 in promoted listings general fees, $538 to ship this thing out by media mail. Again, cost of goods sold in a bulk buy, 91 cents. Total costs 14.98, net profit 14 bucks. Um, I've talked about them before, the like old military manuals and old training manuals. Uh, I like, you can usually get them super cheap if they're in good shape, they will sell. They're not always super fast sellers. I've had this one for maybe six months, uh, but again, to turn 91 cents into essentially $21, uh, not bad. I'll take it. For sale over on Etsy, The Pleasures of Life, Parts 1 and 2 by Sir John Lubbock Henry. This was or by Sir John Lubbock, pardon me, published by the Henry Altimus Company in Philadelphia. It was an illustrated hardcover from the late 1800s. Uh, this was also from a sale, a bulk purchase. Again, 91 cents cost of goods sold. Uh, this person reached out to me and asked if it would be possible for me to upgrade from media shipping to priority so they could have it in time to give as a gift, which I was more than happy to do. I just went in and edited the listing, sent her a quick message and said, you can buy it now. And she did. It was listed for $24.99. It's part of my 10% off sale on Etsy. So it sold for $22.49 plus that priority mail shipping. Total order was $32. Bucks. I paid $3.12 in fees to Etsy. Six ninety to ship. Cost of goods sold ninety one cents. My total costs thirteen fifty four. So thirty two dollar order total netted me eighteen dollars and forty six cents. Another one on Etsy. This is one I uh, got as part of the big uh, free book pickup. The Indianapolis Five Hundred Pictorial History's Greatest Spectacle automobile racing book from 1967. There are multiple versions and editions of this. Uh, the ones from the 1960s and early 70s seem to have the best value. So be on the lookout for them. Uh, again, this was free to me, part of a big estate clean out, sold it on an offer for $22.49. Customer paid $6.88 in shipping. The order total, $31.43. I paid $3.10 to eBay in fees, $6.88 to ship it. $12.04 were my total costs, leaving me a net profit of $19.39. That was an interesting one, too, because in the book, uh, it turned out that there were two old ticket stubs, one from the, I believe it was the 1967 race, and then one from the 1968 race. The one from 1967, uh, I sold at an auction for 10 bucks plus shipping. The other one is still in my inventory. Uh, but that is, a, again, a case of random stuff sometimes stuck in these books. 
Um, you, you look at them and you can end up making a few extra bucks on it. So I always, if there's some random thing stuck in a book, I'll look it up. And you know, again, it was all free to me. So 10 bucks is 10 bucks. I went ahead and did that deal. This was kind of a weird one. This sold over on eBay. Uh, How Pac-Man Eats by Noah Wardip Fruin. This was from 2020, an MIT Press first printing illustrated hardcover in fantastic condition. This was also part of a big estate buyout um, probably five months ago. Had it listed for $31.99, sold it on an outbound offer for $27.19 plus shipping. Customer total was $36.07. I paid $5.25 in uh, normal fees, $2.52 in promoted listings general fees, $6.13 to ship. Again, $0.91 cent cost of goods sold. My total costs were $17.56, which meant I walked away with $18.51 on this really interesting book. Continuing on eBay, uh, it seems like I'm talking about a yearbook every single week. This one is from 1959, the Enterprise Academy, Our Yesterday's Yearbook from Enterprise, Kansas. Uh, picked this up at an estate sale for $2, had it listed and sold for $29.99. I've probably had this maybe four months. So again, not an instant seller, but it, it did sell relatively quickly and that's a pretty good return on investment. Customer paid $5.38 in shipping plus tax. Their total was $37.69. I paid again $4.59 in fees, $2.64 in promoted fees. Shipping was $5.38. My cost of goods sold again, two bucks. My total costs $16.93. My net walking profit $20.76. Uh, old yearbooks, again, I say it every week. If I can get them for two or three bucks or less. I'm, I'm pretty much in all day. I don't mind if they take a while to sell uh, some, at some point, someone is going to be looking for it and I'm going to sell it. This was kind of a weird one. This was another one from the library sale that I went to up in, in Lima. Uh, this is one of those that I had already done my, my shopping and was trying to get out of there, went back in to go to the restroom and ended up looking at another table's worth of books <laughs> and finding some more stuff. Uh, the Conspirators Hierarchy, The Committee of 300, fourth edition paperback by Dr. John Coleman. This was a first printing of this particular edition from back in 1997. If you see one of these, uh, any edition, any year, I would say go ahead again, if you can get it for a couple of bucks and grab it. They all seem to bring pretty decent money. This one I had listed, I believe, for $49.99. I got an offer of $44.99, which I went ahead and accepted because my cost on it was 50 cents. Customer also paid uh, $4.63 in shipping. Their total, $49.62, $7.08 in fees, $3.47 in promoted listings general fee. Again, that 50 cent cost of goods sold, $4.63 in shipping. My costs, $15.68. This thing netted me $33.94. I've never had a more predictive, productive trip <laughs> to the restroom than I had at that library sale. Man, I've, I've made so much money on that last little tub full of books. Uh, first, and I think only sale last week over on Mercari, The Story of a Great Conflict, A History of the War of Secession, 1861 to 1865. This book was published back in 1894 was a hardcover in fairly mediocre condition. The cover was all but separating from the spine. The pages had lots of tanning and foxing, but it is a really hard to find piece. I had it listed, I think for $39.99 plus shipping on Etsy and eBay because I build the shipping into my price on Mercari because I don't like how they do shipping over there. I had this listed and sold it for $48. Uh, no shipping cost to the customer. So 50, 54 with tax was their total. No fees to me because Mercari is uh, fee free for sellers. The fees are all charged to the buyer. I did pay $6.88 to ship this. My cost of goods sold 38 cents. This was part of a big lot of books that I bought. I don't know, 600 and some for about 250 bucks back in late July or early August. Uh, so my total costs were only $9.80 on this. So a $48 item netted me $40.74. Back over to eBay. Uh, similar to one that I sold a couple of weeks ago that I talked about that ultimately got returned. This is Transmission Electron 
Microscopy, a textbook for materials science. This is a second edition paperback from 2009. This is one I picked up at an estate sale as part of a bulk buy for 94 whole cents. This sold for $49.99 plus shipping. The customer's order total, $61.12. Again, I paid $8.62 in fees plus $4.28 in promoted listings fees. This did ship by ground advantage because it was cheaper, $6.66. For those of you who are uh, numerologists, that's not a great look, is it? Uh, total cost $24. My net profit, $37.12. Um, not all textbooks are winners, but a lot of these old, uh, and this isn't even that old, 2009, but a lot of these electron microscope books uh, have been really, really good for me. Uh, Bat Masterson by Richard O'Connor, a first edition Doubleday hardcover from 1957. This also I picked up at the library sale for 50 cents. Had it listed for $69.99, got a watcher, sent out an offer for 15% off, and sold it almost right away for $59.49 plus shipping. The customer paid a total of $68.61. Add uh, regular fees, $9.63. Add fees of $4.80. Shipping, just $4.63. Again, that $0.50 cent cost of goods sold. My total cost, $24. 405 with a net profit of 4456. So be on the lookout for that one. Bat Masterson, the first edition hardcover from the 1950s, probably going to be worth about 60 bucks. This was a kind of a weird one. So I had someone make an offer on this book, uh, and they were overseas. I accepted the offer. And then they must have not been paying attention to what the shipping cost might be because they immediately requested a cancellation with a note that the shipping was too expensive. <laughs> uh, so as I as I talk about pretty regularly, I I don't if somebody, if somebody asks to cancel something, I'm just going to cancel it if I haven't already shipped it because if I don't, it's just going to be a return, and I wasn't trying to mess with that. So I went ahead and accepted the cancellation, um, and then I blocked the guy because I'm not trying to be messing around with somebody who's not paying enough attention to know what shipping is. I do their international shipping program. It only ships one way. So I blocked him. Uh, and then two days later, I sold this book to someone in the same city <laughs> uh, who I can only assume is either a friend or family member, uh, but they did buy it this time at full price. So that worked out as well. I <laughs> made a little bit more money on it than I would have otherwise. Uh, long story. But anyway, The Playbook of Metals by John Henry Pepper. It's a new edition illustrated hardcover published by Rotledge in 1869. This book was actually in pretty good shape. Uh, this is one I did ship out in a box as well. $79.99 plus shipping. Uh, I was only responsible for and I only received the media mail portion of the shipping, so $5.38. I paid $11.89 in fees, $5.98 in ad fees. 538 to ship it. Part of another big lot I own for 94 cents. So my total cost just 2419. Net profit 6118. And that, my friends, is gonna put a wrap on the what sold segment for the week. So that's a that's about all we got. Uh that is a full episode. We're coming up on an hour, which is a bunch. <laughs> uh normally 45 minutes is about all we got here, but uh today was a big one. Uh as always. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me here on the show. I hope you got something useful out of it and it wasn't just me ranting away. Uh, if you did, do me a favor, as always, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button. If you're listening to the podcast somewhere and that site has the ability to leave a review, again, if you got something out of it, hit, leave, me, leave me some stars, leave me some five-star reviews. I would appreciate it. Feel free to comment if you're watching on YouTube or listening over on Spotify. And as always, Feel free to share this with anyone who you think might enjoy it as well. Uh, nothing special planned for Wednesday. I will be here live, uh, but it'll probably just be a listing show, which, as I mentioned a bit ago, you seem to enjoy very much. <laughs> so if you're not doing anything Wednesday at 11 o'clock, come list with me and uh, we'll do some reselling chat. With that, my friends, I hope everybody is doing well. And now it's time to sell. Thanks, guys. You have been listening to the Galaxy CDs Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will catch you again next time.